short uh, intro written by a former biohacker summit speaker, uh, the, the philosopher Max Moore. And he has written a beautiful uh, little piece which is called A Letter to Mother Nature. And I think that this letter to Mother Nature, it, in, it captures powerfully what biohacking can be and what biohacking uh, ultimately can be inspired by. So I'm going to read uh, out this short uh, letter uh, as the start of the day. Dear Mother Nature, we want to thank you for the many wonderful qualities you bestowed upon us, your human offspring. You raised us from self-replicating chemicals to civilization-building mammals. You've given us wonderful powers in terms of being uh, intelligent, sentient, and beings with capacity uh, for empathy. At the same time, Mother Nature, you have not, you missed some things in our design. You somehow did a poor job when you did the human constitution. You made us vulnerable to disease and aging. You compel us to age. You held out on us by giving the sharpest senses to other animals. You made us functional only under very narrow environmental circumstances. You gave us limited memory, poor impulse control, and uh, odd urges. And not least importantly, you forget to give us the operating manual for ourselves. What you've made us, mother, is glorious, yet flawed. Therefore, we want to pursue some amendments to the human constitution. Amendment number one. We will no longer tolerate the tyranny of aging and death. We will endow ourselves with enduring vitality and remove our expiration dates. You're free to share when you hear these things if you want. <laughs> Amendment number two. We want to expand our perceptual range and sensory universe. We will seek to exceed the perceptual abilities of any living creature and devise novel senses to improve our appreciation and understanding of the beautiful world around us. Amendment number three. We will improve our neural, neural organization and capacity, expanding our working memory and enhance our intelligence. Amendment number four. We will supplement our neocortex with a global distributed exocortex by connecting ourselves to a distributed network of sensors, information processors, and intelligence, it will increase our degree of self-awareness. Amendment number five. We do no longer accept to be the slaves of our genes. We will take charge our, over our genetic programming and achieve mastery of our biological and neurological processes. Not content with that, we will seek to complete our bodily form and function, refining and augmenting our physical and intellectual abilities beyond those of any human in history. Amendment number six. We will cautiously let boldly reshape our motivational patterns and emotional responses in a way we as individuals deem healthy. Amendment number seven. Mother, we recognize your genius in using carbon-based compounds to develop us. Yet we will not limit our physical, intellectual, and emotional capacities by remaining purely biological systems. We will increasingly integrate advanced technology into ourselves. These amendments to our constitution may take us from a human to a transhuman condition, as individuals and as a civilization. This will allow us to form relationships, cultures, and societies of unprecedented innovation, richness, freedom, and responsibility. Welcome everyone to Biohacker Summit. 
I think it's the seventh edition now, and it's the second one in Stockholm. And what biohacking is, it's the art and science of optimizing your performance, health, and well-being. It's about the application of deep understanding of human physiology, biology, technology into our current and future human condition. And looking at the human computer in general, I mean, this is the blueprint for it. Um, those are the different metabolic pathways that are right now processing different molecules throughout your body. We have taken a reductionist approach to understanding this complexity. It's time to take a holistic uh, approach, taking a look at this whole computer as it is. And that's where, where artificial intelligence and its application on understanding biological systems will definitely take us forward as humanity. Now, we have broken down the human body into pieces to this kind of Lockean philosophy of atomizing universe. And now we have the genetic code. And we thought that now that we have the genetic code, we have it all kind of uh, figured out. Um, it absolutely gives us a lot of good ways to understand what's going on, to understand heritage disease, to understand things like nutrigenomics, where, for example, in my case, I have a predisposition for celiac disease, although it has not been diagnosed, but I'm not triggering my system to really bring that disease to manifest itself by, for example, eating too much wheat products. Um, at the same time, I live in the Northern Hemisphere. I don't get necessarily enough sunlight. And when I supplement on vitamin D, I need to take 10 times more than other people to get the serum levels where they are supposed to be because of genetic reasons. Now, many people in Finland and probably in Sweden also have this gene called APOE4 that increases increase risk for Alzheimer's disease. It, by the way, it also increases the intelligence. So you can choose, you know, maybe you die from Alzheimer's or cardiovascular disease or, you know, you're intelligent. Maybe you are just playing the clock a little bit faster forward. In my case, I don't have that. Am I less intelligent? I don't know. But um, in my case, saturated fat is not such a big issue. So we are all unique. We are all individuals. And what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for another person. But not just only for genetic reasons, but also for epigenetic reasons. So it now turns out that the environment is perhaps even more important of controlling this process. And what I'm interested in is then to gather the data to understand what works and what doesn't. And that's where we get into the biosignals that you can gather from the human body. Here's an example of the data that I get throughout the night. So I'm looking at how much I get REM sleep, how I encode memories that I've learned throughout the day into long-term memory. And I look at deep sleep, how well uh, I'm getting into uh, the deep restorative parts of sleep. So that my brain can also, or the lymphatic system, the extension of the lymphatic system can wash out the metabolic byproducts. Uh, for example, amyloid beta that's linked to Alzheimer's disease risk from my brain. But sometimes, like running a conference like this, you don't sleep enough. And uh, you, are, you, are, you are flying from one place to another, you have deadlines, all that. You don't necessarily always get eight hours of sleep. So what I'm looking at in those moments is recovery and recovery of my nervous system specifically. And I look at the balance in my autonomous nervous system between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. That tells me more uh, of my ability to deal with acute stress and acute uh, issues. And then when I have the opportunity to sleep, then I, then I sleep it in. Now, I also have the oral ring and they are launching now the new rings. Uh, I have one, and several other people in the audience also have the new one. And what it helps me to do is to bind all that data together and give me a much better understanding of what's going on. Because it's not only sleep duration, it's also my activity, it's how much I sit, it is my uh, resting heart rate, my body temperature, all of those. Once it plays it 
together, you start to more understand kind of your unique variations throughout the day. I might look at true, you know, these different unique variations throughout the day. And um, I've noticed that if during the day I don't do meditation or breathing exercises or just wind it down, go to sauna, go swimming, uh, walk in a forest, I'm not, not getting these green re uh, restorative parts of the parasympathetic nervous system activation. And that will then compromise my sleep quality that night in terms of nervous system recovery. So in today's modern world where you're bombarded by messages and information all the time, you have to start kind of taking your own life and your own signal load into your own hands to be able to deal with all that. Now, biomarkers are where you see the kind of response in terms of long-term uh, health consequences in your whole biological system. And I've been tracking now for years my data. And well, if I do something and it seems like it's doing something on a short-term basis, great. But if it's doing something in the long-term basis, then that's evidence that the biohacking that I'm getting myself into is doing something. So when you look at my uh, cardiac risk, for example, my results rise to HDL ratio. It's now from 2 um, to 0 0.5. If you look at my kidney function, genetically, I have higher risk for kidney disease. I've been able to improve my kidney function on a constant basis. Even though I take all those supplements, even though I take all those you know, herbs from health stores, you know, my kidney function, my liver function, my, you know, my whole body is just getting better. Now, looking at my ability to deal with blood sugar uh, fluctuations, and my risk for diabetes, I've been able to take myself out of almost pre-diabetic condition to no diabetes, uh, even at close sight. Now, another thing that I'm very happy about is when I started this, my testosterone levels were like I'm 40 to 50 year old man. I was 30. And now when I'm 36, my testosterone levels look like I'm less than 25 year old. So I've been able to reverse the risk of becoming an old man. Hooray. So <laughs> what gets measured gets managed. That's what Peter Druck Drucker said. Now we have the quantified self tools to really tap into and figure out if all those you know, research articles that you're reading, all those advice from different experts and all your own experiments are actually making any sense in terms of the data. So you can track yourself. And that's super powerful because health is to be in balance and imbalance leads to disease. That's what I learned the hard way. And looking at where we are going, we are now getting much more data, not just in terms of health records or lab tests that you do when you're born or we you get a new job or you, know, you go through a routine test, but you're getting data of your day-to-day -day activities, your day-to-day -day behavior from your environment. And that gives us not just snapshots, but a real-time picture. And with artificial intelligence and data analytics, we will be able to start to predict that if you continue through these lifestyle choices, or you continue eating this or that, or you know, uh, exposing yourself to whatever environmental things, or even stress from work, uh, that will increase your risk for many things. But if you do these things, you will be able to prevent uh, that. So that's the real healthcare, what healthcare is supposed to be. Bioinformatics will be for health, what the microscope was for biology. And looking at, you know, now the total picture of your lifestyle, how we can take all those different aspects together into one picture individually, we can really truly become experts of our own health. Until now, we were kind of externalizing that to some other person. And even that person, being a doctor, didn't have as much data as we have today potentially available. And once we be able to combine that data, not just humans who do errors, but with machines who are more capable of crunching the numbers, we'll be able to kind of get deeper into the code. Information is primary. The universe is based on information. The information in your DNA is copying forward. You exist as long as it's needed 
for that code to be copied forwards for the epigenetic change, the environmental factors to be able to influence that code. Now we have the potential to take that into our own hands. We are moving from evolution by natural selection to evolution by intelligent design. We are moving from reductionism in healthcare to more holistic uh, dimension. That was almost a negative term. Now it's a positive term because the current healthcare system is a sick care system. It has very little to do with healthcare. True healthcare is preventive. True healthcare can prevent many conditions that we will face. And these are the things as a curator of this summit I, I was looking out for, you know, speakers who would be able to share you their best knowledge better than I am in terms of how to hack this whole system and how to, you know, get your head around with it. So it's a cramped day. It's a fully backed day as we, <laughs> um, as we know. And we have attendees from 32 countries. Uh, Sweden is greatly represented, but over, you know, half of these people are from other countries. We have people from UK. Any, anyone from UK? I don't hear anything. UK? Yeah. Anyone from US? Okay. Someone. All right. I'm from Finland. Teemu from Finland. Hello. What the audience measures. Uh, pretty typical things that we have always done, like weight and exercise. Now sleep. We look at heart rate, steps, blood pressure, but we're getting into more interesting stuff now, like with heart rate variability, like looking at calorie consumption in more detail. And when we go into the long tail of things that this audience tracks, it's super interesting. Like almost everyone here has tried something. And that is where we can learn from. And not just measuring, but also hacking those numbers through supplements, through fasting, through intermittent fasting, through sauna, through yoga, through low carb, you know, ketogenic diets even nootropics, other diets. And that's also a long tail. That's what I'm fascinated about the Biker Summit is the fact that everyone here is a super expert on something. And what I'm interested in also, in terms of all of you, is that you have something to teach and you have something to learn here. This is not a corporate trade show where you go because your employer sent you here. You're here because you can learn something yourself. And that makes the spark in people's eyes at every single Biocare Summit I go. It's not a you know, thing you go for work. It's also something where you can learn from. We have great exhibitors here upstairs. Enjoy what they have to offer. Our main sponsors are Aura, Happy Food Store, who just opened up next door. In the, uh, you, can, you can get the best superfoods. It's, by the way, a Finnish chain. So now I have the power of accessing in Sweden, you know, the best superfoods in the world, thanks to Foodin and a uh, bunch of other great companies. Yeah, and Ark of Scandinavia. So take a look at that. You can experience this conference through headphones because biohackers are not sitting all day long. If you were wondering why there is not enough seats, now you have the answer. There is headphones over there. You can rent wireless headphones. You can walk around on the exhibition area, you know, interact with these people. These are super interesting people. We are recording this. It's streaming live, you get the recording package, no worries, you, will, you are not missing anything. But what you will miss is the discussions with other people if you're not investing in that. So do that, because this is a community, this is not a conference, okay? And the Wi-Fi, Epicenter, you can access that with Urban Escape, okay? And by the way, if you want to rent the headphones, it's the, the Biohacker Center stand. Use the hashtag BH Summit, tweet, and we will retweet your best ones. Good. I think we are ready to start the program because there is nothing here. Oh, these guys. Thank you very much for making this happen. So with that, I'll let Hannes to guide us through the rest of the morning.